So yeah, Ali Fingers, Ali Fingers Asbai, that's my name. I'm very pleased to be here and hopefully share a few of my thoughts with you. My talk is the power of comedy. Now, as a statement, when you, when you tell someone the power of comedy, well, actually, scratch that. I was, I was telling someone, I'm doing a TED talk, and my talk is called uh, the power of comedy. And the guy said, what, what, but power of comedy, comedy, power, how, how, does that, how does that fit in? Like The power of comedy. See, growing up here, they always tell you in schools, don't be a clown. Don't joke around. Life is not about jokes. Life is serious. It's all about facing your problems. How old are you? 13. How many times did your family tell you, be serious? How many times did they tell you off in school not to laugh? That's what we grow up with. When I, got, when, I, when I first started working, my dad told me, he said, hey, you're going to go work, you're going to join a professional environment, don't laugh. Let us hack we are wired. Let us hack. Because if you laugh, they're not going to take you seriously. La life is all about facing your problems. It's all about being serious. But if you really think about it, I mean, comedy has its roots in drama. And drama is all about conflict. Drama is all about problems and facing them. They're in your face. So you got to face them. Roots in drama, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to go back here. This is why this symbol represents drama. It doesn't represent happiness and sadness. It doesn't represent comedy and tragedy. It's drama. Two faces of the same coin. If you do look at drama, let's look at literature, right? Before movies, before plays, before everything, it was, it was written. It was, it was text. This is freaky. But um, if you look at Shakespeare, let's, let's take a look at Romeo and Juliet, right? I hope everybody's seen the movie, because I'm about to ruin it for you. They died. <laughs> right? It was, it was a serious issue. It was a problem. You know, they were in love. They wanted to get together, but they couldn't get together. Oh, the emotions, the pain. Oh, kill me, please. And in the end, they couldn't face their problem. The only, the only solution for them was suicide. It's in your face. It hurts. It brings you down. It's so emotional. It was a very dramatic way of looking at that problem. Now, you can look at the same problem from a lighter perspective. It's the same issue. Can't get married. Can't be together. Kill yourself. You still walk away with the same conclusion. But with drama... It's very serious, very emotional. You have to clear out your emotions. You go through that journey in drama. You go from the beginning to the middle to the end, and it's all emotional. It's all hitting you. And in the end, you do feel the... Whew, it's over. It was a big problem, and you walk away thinking about it, but... Whew, you go through it from a lighter perspective, from a comic perspective. It's still serious. But in the moment, it's a bit lighter on your soul. It's a little lighter on your heart. It's not better or worse. It's just a different way of looking at the same issue. You still walk away with the same information. And I really believe this, that at the, at the bottom of every problem, you will always be able to find a funny way of looking at it. And you'll walk away being a little happier about it. Not the problem, but the fact that, yeah, it's a problem, but I can deal with it. You know, laugh about it a little bit. For me, comedy is a very, it's a personal subject for me, you know, like it's a personal thing in my life. I was always into theater, I was always into, you know, acting and whatnot, and I started Marcus Salmon and doing the whole thing, but when did, when did comedy become a, become a big part of my life? I've been doing stand-up since 2006 or so, and I started in college in Dublin. And it wasn't like official, just open mics here and there, little college shows. I had, that, I had that feel of a crowd. Back then, I didn't know that a comic was supposed to write his material. I didn't know that a comic was supposed to prepare thought, prepare issues, prepare yourself. You know, you're facing the crowd. At the end of the day, it's, it's a conversation between me and you. And by you, I mean you. You all become one person to a comic. But back then, I didn't know. I just thought a comic gets up on stage and tries to be funny. Ha ha, laugh with me. It was, still, it was still something that called me to it, you know? 
I moved back to Bahrain in 2007. And Bahrain is a small place. You know, everybody knows everybody else. If they don't know you, they know your cousin. And a friend of mine called me and he said, hey, uh, we're arranging the first stand-up comedy show in the region. I don't know if you guys know, but stand-up in the GCC started in Bahrain in 2007 with the Axis of Evil comedy tour. It was Maz Jibrani, Ahmed Ahmed, Dean Abidal, and Aaron Cater. These guys are all about, you know, Middle Eastern origins, but we're in the world now. They're class A acts. It started here. And I got the call and they said, hey, we heard of you. You've done stand-up in college. You've got some, some sort of experience in that, in that realm. And we got these guys coming down to Bahrain. We're, we're arranging the first comedy show. And they're looking for local opening acts. Are you interested? Do you want to share the stage? I said, hell no. It was scary. These are people you see on TV. They're like TV people. I'm like Jidali people. <laughs> These two people don't mix together. And I said, no, thanks, but no thanks. Because when I, when I came back in, in 06-ish here at a summer break, I think it was, and I tried to do stand-up here. It was a banker's union event, and my dad was a banker, a.k.a. slave. And he said, come down to the Bankers Union event with me and, you know, you can do your, you know, your clown stuff. I tried to, people laugh, people enjoyed it, but it didn't click with me, you know, like in my heart, it wasn't, uh, I didn't feel that connection. At the time, I felt that the Bahraini audience is just not ready yet. It's just not there to accept this form of entertainment, this form of social commentary, so to speak, this form of, you know, like, comedy. We're used to plays, masrahiyat. Everybody grew up here watching Kuwaiti plays and Bahraini plays, and that's, that's, a, that's a medium we're comfortable with. But stand-up, for me, it wasn't. So when the guy said, do you want to open for, you know, Maz and them, I said, no, I'll come watch the show. Send me a free ticket, I'll come watch the show but I'm not going to perform. I had to pay for my own ticket. They said, we're on a budget, because, you know, we can't afford to give you the ticket. So I had to buy my ticket, and I went, and I sat in the back of Gaadoni. They didn't even give me proper seats. But um, I watched the show, and in all fairness, I was thrilled. I was amazed. It just got me. I was like, not because of Maz and Ahmed and Dean and Aaron. Those guys, they're, they're, they're top notch. This is what they do. What really wowed me was the local guys that came up on stage. It was the Bahraini guys that came up on stage. It was a Saudi dude that came up on stage. And I was like, wow, I know these people. These people are Jid Ali people just like me. And the way the crowd was just eating it up. They were just eating it up. They loved it. They loved the fact that there was a guy up there talking about eat lunch and hoozy and mendy and chicken and saying hi to your grandfather trying to avoid the booger in his nose when you're kissing him. And the crowd loved it because they were talking about things that happen in your life, happen in our life, happen to us. And in that moment, I saw the connection. I saw the connection that I didn't see when I first started when I came back here. I was like, I'm going to do stand-up comedy. I didn't feel it then. But when I went to Axis of Evil, and I watched how the crowd was just reacting to the local guys. I felt like, wow, this is, I want a piece of this. I feel like I can have something to offer. These good people just like yourselves, they were like, wow, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe they, might, they might like what I have to say at some point. So I called the guy up after the show. I said, hey, man, you're doing this again. Call me. Next time, I'll, I'll jump in. I refused the call in the beginning, but now I'm calling you. Please get me involved. I want to do this. And they did reach out to me later on and they said, hey, you want to do this? Now we're establishing a proper club. Now you have to audition. And I did. Alhamdulillah, I did great. I'm happy about it. It was fun. It was interesting. And then along the years, I got to open for people like Omid Jalili. I've worked with Maz. I got a chance to meet him. He was a really sweet guy. Ahmed Ahmed. I got Dean Abidullah. I've got, like, I've worked with internationals. I've worked with the guys that do this for a living. And I've also worked with the regional guys. You know, guys from Saudi, guys from Kuwait, guys from Qatar, guys from, from the region. People, people like us, you know. And 
what really, what really got me is that the professionals, like Maz told me, he said it's a numbers game. Don't worry about hitting it big from the beginning. You just keep doing it. Omid told me, you have what it takes. The fact that you got here and you got on stage and you made people laugh. And for the Omid show, most of my routine was about using an Arabic toilet. You know, the squat. I did half of my set in a squat position. And people liked it. I was like, wow, it's not just me facing the problem of balance. But he said, the fact that you got here and you did say something and people liked it, all you have to do is keep doing it. Just keep going. And it will open doors for you. In my opinion, stand-up is the most basic form of entertainment, basic form of comedy. And from there, it opened up doors for me to do voiceover acting. I've done cartoons, I've done commercials, I've done videos. I've done, I got into writing, I was writing scripts. I got into acting, I got into pff, different projects. I recently launched my own little sketch comedy group, Misfits Comedy. And it's, it's still at the beginning stages. But I'm basically taking my stand-up material and I'm translating it into film. I have no film experience whatsoever, just from the projects that I got in, invited to work on with. But it, it gave me that drive, because I understand that, that we do have a lack of representation, cultural representation in the form of comedy. And it, 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 it's just, for me, I think I'm going to marry comedy. We're still dating. I'm still courting her. But why Bahrain? Why here? Why did stand-up start here? Like later on, the, the, the guys in the region went back home and initiated their own little routines, their own little you know, comedy circuits, so to speak. And then they went on and developed it in, in Arabic. Other people went into videos and uh, YouTube shows. But it started here. Why Bahrain? In my opinion, I think we were just ripe enough up here to accept this form of entertainment, to accept this, this type of joke. That's just my opinion. And why were we the first to initiate it, to get into it, to do it? Because if you look at our history of Bahrain, Bahrain has always, has always been a very strategic point. We're right in the center of a major trading route. People trade here. It's right in the center. People want to come here, they chill, shirbun chai, and then continue on their way. They stay here. It attracted a lot of, a lot of interest. A lot of, a lot of people had their eyes on this place, not because of the weather. We didn't have Jid Ali back then. They came here because of where we are. We're in the center of a major trading route. And let's, this, this predates oil. Oil was the, was the main thing that really shed some light on this region. I agree, yes, because it was money. But before that, I mean, we went through the civilization of Dilmun. After Dilmun, it was Aradus, it was Tylus. We had British colonization, we got Portuguese colonization, the Persians came here. <laughs> <laughs> but, but why, you know? Because we're right in the center. These superpowers wanted to be here. They wanted a presence here. Why? Because of where we are. So when they came here, not only did we as locals have to deal with them, but we had to deal with their networks too. We had to live with them. When we're dealing with the British, we're dealing with everybody that the British deal with. Same thing with the Portuguese. They came here and they brought their business here. They brought their contacts here. They brought their networks here. And the locals were exposed to all of it. We're exposed to foreign thought. And I, I, I've heard collectivists here a bunch of times today. And I agree, yes, the Arab culture, Muslim culture, it is like that. But for us, in my opinion, because we've been exposed more than everybody else or before everybody else to foreign thought, to foreign entertainment, to foreign culture, we took some of it in into our culture. So it was easier for us to accept other things. Even our language got affected. Everybody here... Well, let's, let's, let's hit a number. I think 80% here would understand what Samandega means. What is Samandega? Entigada chinesh Samandega. Why? What does it mean? Where does it come from? It comes from back when we used to deal with Indian merchants. Come down to the port. They'd unload their product, their merchandise. Put on the dock. 
and then go down, rent a room, shirbun and then what would happen to their stuff? What would happen to their, to their product, to their merchandise? They'd usually have a guard. They'd have a person, and he'd just stand there watching it, waiting. Waiting for who? Waiting for an official to come down and take it off his hands. He was a delivery boy, but he was also a watchman. So when people walk by, hey, what are you doing here? And his response would be, in his language, I'm Saman Diega. I'm here to deliver the stuff. Saman, it's Indian, it means stuff. Diega, to give. I'm here to give the product. So to the locals walking by, like, who is he? Oh, he's Saman Diega. <laughs> what does he do? Oh, Saman Diega. It became synonymous with being idle. Guy wasn't being idle, he was doing his job. But to everybody else, that's what it meant. To be a Samandega is to stand there and do nothing. Kind of like you, DJ. <laughs> Another one, let's go away from Indian culture. We were talking about British colonization. What did we get in our language? A lot, a lot of terms, but my favorite, Shil Shaddan. Shil Shaddan, huh? You're working hard. You're sweating. Shigal Shaddan. Where does Shigal Shaddan come from? Elba. It's true. Elba, aluminum, aluminum plant. Factory. How? During the last hour of every working day, management, British, would ring the bell. It was a bell for shutdown. It was the last hour of the plant. What does that mean? It means whatever you're working with, whatever is in your hands, bang it out quick, finish it. We're shutting down the plant. Finish your job. Work hard. Get it quick. So to the locals working, whenever they heard the bell, and a guy would be like, shut down. Let's work, yalla. It, what, do, what does it mean now to the locals walking by, someone working hard? Shigal shut down, huh? Afialik. So we're already, we were ready. We've always been ready to accept new ideas, to accept new ways of thinking. And in my opinion, in 2007, we were ripe enough for stand-up. So comedy has power. Laughter is contagious. You guys were laughing at some of the stuff that I'm saying now, which is really nice. You're boosting up my self-confidence and everything. But what's really happening? For example, if you're sitting right there, love the dress, by the way. Not you, but your dress is nice as well. <laughs> you're sitting right here, and I said something. I'm attempting to make you laugh. You don't find me that funny. You don't like my hair. But your friend does. She finds me funny. She's cracking up. The fact that she's laughing at something that you don't really find that funny, just a little amusing. Ha ha. Just because she's laughing, you're going to laugh with her. Because laughter is contagious. In the same way, if you're sitting with someone that's depressed, and you're not conscious of it, and that depression is just taking you in, you take that some of, energy, some of that energy back home with you. Emotions are contagious. And I like to dive deep in laughter and happiness. See, comedy changes perspectives. You guys, you guys, I hope, all saw Patch Adams, right? The film? Laughter is contagious was the main point of the film. It was based, it was based on a true story. It was a doctor. What did he say? He said, that stop, he said, stop treating patients like they're numbers on a clipboard. Treat them like they're people. Make them happy. Make them laugh. Make, me, make them feel good. And then they will begin to heal themselves. That's just how it works. It, nobody knows how to do it. Nobody knows how to actually go in and, I'm going to make you laugh and I'll cure your fever. Not like that. But something does happen and the film was all about it. And then... It helped the patients take their diseases, take their issues in it from a lighter perspective. You know, sure, I'm going to die, but whatever. It makes you look at a problem and just break it down. 
into little pieces. Like, if we, if we go back and look at drama versus comedy, if you look at a mountain, right, just a mountain, let's say we're looking at it from a dramatic perspective, it'll be a mountain! <gasps> but from a comic perspective, it's just a bunch of pebbles piled up together. Just a bunch of rocks. It's still the same mountain. It all depends on how you're looking at it. And that's, that's what comedy does. That's when you, when, you, when you look at your problems in life, when you, you, you got bills to pay, you got your kids in school, they're failing. They're failing. Well, you laugh about it. Yeah, he's failing, but you're cute. It makes you feel better about life. It makes you continue in a better way, in my opinion. But at the same time, comedy has a dark side. I'm going to give you another second to look at this. The dark side of comedy. What is the dark side of comedy? If comedy was the force. I'm not paying nothing to Star Wars, by the way. You can choose the light side of the force, or you can choose the dark side of the force. The point of the matter is that it is still a force. There is still power. Now, what is the dark side of comedy? How, how, how can you look at comedy from a darker perspective? What do bullies do in school? A lot of things, yes, but the main thing, what, what happens, at least for us here. They'll find a person and they'll ridicule him. They'll crack jokes. They'll make fun of him. Make fun of the way he's dressed. Make fun of the way he talks. Make fun of the way he looks. Make fun of everything. What does that do? It'll bring everybody around him. They will all point at one person and laugh and they will destroy them. Who gains that power? The bully. Now, why he's doing it, we could go deeper and deeper into that. Oh, he's you know, present, projecting his insecurities on the person he's bullying. Oh, he's turning people's attention away from his own issues to point it at someone else, regardless of why he's doing it. But what is he doing? He's using laughter. He is using comedy to make people laugh at somebody else. What does that do to the person? It crushes them. Dictators. Dictators use this, it's a, it's a, or leaders, so to speak. You know, it's a very, it's a very um, powerful, po powerful technique. They gauge the mood of the nation. You guys recognize the guy on the right? Jamal Abdel Nasser, ex-president. Right? Now, according to whatever resources you'd, you'd, you'd research into the matter, um, you'd know that he was a bit paranoid. Now, he was followed a lot. A lot of people support this person, but he was paranoid about what made people laugh. What were people laughing about in his nation? He'd send out feelers from a secret service to check what kind of jokes are circulating in the nation. What are they laughing about? If you can identify what they're laughing about, then you're identifying what their problems, what their problems are. And in his opinion, as long as they weren't laughing about me, I'm okay. I still have my power. What happened to Donald Trump? Donald Trump, this, this guy could have taken the United States out of debt with a check. One check. Boom. What happened to him now? One of the most powerful people in the world because of his bank account. When you used to think Donald Trump, you think power, you think dollar sign, you think, oof, might said something, upset the wrong person, and people went out and told jokes about him. They made videos about him. They posted up memes about him. They sent out tweets about him. And what did that do? It separated him from his power. When you used to think Donald Trump, you think power. Now when you think Donald Trump, you think... He's no longer that powerful. He's no longer a beast in your mind. That's what comedy did. That's, that's what it does. A lot of other, apparently the KGB used to do this too. He used to make sure that people aren't laughing about the system. So there is power. Leaders understand it. Bullies understand it. I understand it. And I hope you understand it. Doop. Let's go before all of this. Let's go before all of that, right? Philosophy. Two major philosophers, Aristotle and Plato. What do, they, what do they say about comedy? Well, how do they see comedy? Aristotle, 
According to him, a comedy is about the, the fortunate arise of a sympathetic character. A happy ending is all that was required for him. You go through your problems, you look at it from a lighter perspective, and yes, there are hurdles, there are, there are, there are obstacles in your path, but you know, things happen, you laugh about it, you go on, a happy ending is what you need to carry on with your life. Plato, on the other hand, understood the power of it, but he thought a bit different. Plato was, in my opinion, obsessed with uh, slavery and mastership. Slaves and masters, that's basically, what, from what I read of him, that's, that's basically what he's talking about. What did he say about comedy? He said, comedy is a destruction to the self. Should be tightly controlled if you want to achieve the ideal state. Control what they laugh at or they will destroy you. And Aristotle said, hey, laugh at the problems. What is the, what is the issue? Just go on. Yes, it's a problem, but go on. Plato looked at it from the other way. So they both believed in their power, and the power of comedy. That's the philosophical question, right? Is it good or bad? One of them said it can be good. The other one said it can be bad, but still used in a good way for you. There's achievement on both sides of the spectrum, but it's your perspective and how you choose to apply it is what's going to determine the outcome. My two cents. Don't take yourself too seriously. Take life with a smile. Life is serious. Life is about facing problems. Life is about getting over obstacles and hurdles that will stop you, that will try to stop you from going to the next level. Life is all about thresholds and crossing them. But if you look at them from a dramatic perspective, oh, they're taking away the car, I can't make payments. Or, they're taking away the car, I can't make the payments. That's how I live my life. And that's how, how I think people should try to look at the issues in their lives. You'll, you'll go about your days without this excess frustration of negatively charged emotions that will stop you from getting to where you need to go. I don't know where we're going, but I think we have some sort of control as to what direction we're going to go to. It all depends on how we look at it how we look at the problems that appear to be stopping us from getting to the next level. So I do hope you take life with a smile, and I hope I didn't bore you to death. Thank you very much. <laughs>